Okay, um, so I feel a little bit bad. This is actually more like three talks, one about working with juniors, one about teaching functional programming and why we should do more of it, and one about mob programming. And like we're kind of not gonna do justice to any of the three, but we'll go quickly and see how far we can get. It's also kind of a sales pitch. Um, you know, like I want you to hire juniors and work with them, and I want you to do functional programming, especially I want you to have your juniors do functional programming. And we did this mob programming experiment, and it was really cool. I think it's worth trying in a lot of places. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of pitching all three of these things to you in one uh, very fast talk. So uh, first off, um, juniors, right? So even while I was preparing this talk, the director of engineering at OC Tanner was uh, trying to build this argument that functional programming is really hard, that you can't do it unless you're at least this smart and that most of even our seniors aren't smart enough to do functional programming. <laughs> I think he's wrong. Um, <laughs> and even while he's trying to build this argument, you know, I'm going out and teaching juniors and new developers how to do functional programming successfully. So, but I thought about it and I realized, hey, functional programming was pretty hard for me. I actually took 10 years to learn how to do functional programming. Part of the problem was that I thought I was actually a pretty good programmer already. Uh, it took me about five years just to figure out I, I was a horrible programmer. <laughs> it took me a couple more years to fix that, and then I had to get into functional programming. I made some odd conclusions along the way. Somewhere along the way, I got the impression that Haskell didn't matter, um, that it wasn't actually worth learning Haskell. It wasn't until I talked to my friend Will Bird that uh, he was able to tell me concisely why it was really important that I learn Haskell. And not only did that open the door for Haskell, it made me realize that in order to teach functional programming, I had to understand why we want to do functional programming. I had to, I had to have the context for it. Uh, so I put up here the, the top five reasons to hire juniors. Uh, first and foremost, we just, it's hard to get seniors. It's even harder to get good seniors. Um, and there's this weird thing. It's easier to train a junior than it is to train a senior, okay? Just like me, 10 years ago. Seniors tend to not be very receptive to learning how to be better. Um, but as soon as I put juniors in with the seniors, the seniors become better programmers. They are responsible for the development of the juniors, so they're constantly teaching. We're creating a culture that expects people to learn. You put juniors in there, they need to learn, and then the seniors also feel like it's okay for them to learn. We create a culture of learning. Um, Uh, another reason why we need the juniors is, is just because we, we don't have enough developers overall. There just aren't enough people to fill the jobs. So let's look at some stats for my hometown. I live in Salt Lake City in Utah in the western United States. And this is a, a little bit scary, right? There's almost nobody, no developers, out of work. When you look at JavaScript and Scala, there is literally nobody out of work. <laughs> this is not just true in Salt Lake City, it's true in other places in the States as well. You can see we're not making enough developers. We only have about 2,000 new graduates in Utah for 7,000 openings. The amount of money that they pay us, do you see this one? It's a $120,000 offer for developers with two years of experience, JavaScript and one statically typed language. And they only have to have like six months of experience with Java or C Sharp. We don't have enough diversity, especially in Utah. Um, Utah is uh, where, it's like the home state for, for the Church of the Later Day Saints, the Mormon church, and they tend to not have very many women, um, especially. So we can't increase our diversity, we can't increase our, our pool of hireable developers by hiring them away from other companies. We have to bring new people into it. 
new people are juniors. Ultimately, you know, we're not after juniors, we're after, you know, seniors. We're after really good developers, right? Um, I think that often the best way to get a really good senior is to make your own. So you start with a junior, and then you figure out how to train them up to a, a good senior level. So um, I've seen some talks, I've, I've read some stuff, especially lately, uh, saying 10x developers don't, don't exist. We don't have 10x developers. Not really, that's a myth. Um, and I got thinking about that, and I, I don't think it's true. I think there are developers who put out 10 times as much code, okay? It's crap, the code is horrible, and the developers are assholes. <laughs> Not all of them, I'm sorry. Um, present company excluded, right? Um, <laughs> but really, it's not code that we need, it's value. Um, and in fact, you know, like, I can put out 10 times as much code. All I have to do is, you know, like, write code that's, you know, 10 times longer than it needs to be, right? Um, so we, we want developers who put out 10 times as much value, which is actually, you know, a little bit trickier. But it's not all that much trickier, because all you need to do is make the right decisions along the way. Decisions that are just slightly better than average, but compound exponentially. So in this example, let's say you've got your average developer. They make 10 average decisions. You know, 1.0 to the 10th power is 1.0. But if, if that de developer is making a decision that delivers just a little bit more value, 1.25, times as much as the average developer, and they have 10 decisions along a project that compound, well, now we've got our order of magnitude. That goes in the other direction, too. You can see how disastrous it can be to have an inexperienced developer who can't deliver the value making all of those decisions on the project. Um, so I, I presented that formula, or that, that example, and, and I got some questions about, well, you know, do we actually make 10 decisions along a project that, that could compound like that? So I put together 10 of them. These are a bunch of different decisions that we can make that increase the value. And obviously, if all of our developers are making decisions like this, well, well we don't have 10x developers, we have 1x developers that are 10 times as much value as, as our 1x developers used to be. So we use the right abstractions. Uh, I just want to point out, I've got this organized under simple and correct. That's my coding mantra. That's what I want my code to be. That's what I want all my developers to do. Write simple, correct code. So <clears throat> um, simple code is, is using the right abstractions. Usually, that also means using the right programming language. Um, the right language depends on the project, uh, but I think very often it's a functional programming language. That's why we're here, right? Uh, we write code that's easy to read, easy to reason about, that scales. Um, we write code that doesn't have a lot of dependencies. Um, those are places for things to go wrong. We write code that um, often, <laughs> One thing I like to see is core business logic written in the plain old language, not in, not in the framework, not in Express, not in Rails, not in Django, whatever, play. Um, reduce the dependencies, especially in the core business logic. For our side effects, we can have those dependencies. <clears throat> our code is correct when it does what it's specified to do, but only what it's specified to do. I think that's really important. Uh, it was the founder of the OpenBSD project that taught me that, Theo Durat. The, mo the easiest way to write secure code is to write code that does only what it's specified to do. And I suppose if we wanted to write code that provided a buffer overflow, well, that would be code that does what it's specified to do, right? But if it's not supposed to provide a buffer overflow, it's a security hole. <laughs> um, we write code that's not weighed down by technical debt. We write code that is using the right patterns. It's another expression of the abstractions that we're using. If we're using a broken pattern for our problem, we can't write correct code with it. 
And yet, so often, we're using broken patterns because we're using the wrong language, the wrong framework, because it's what we know and it's what we use where we're at. And so there is clearly a trend over the last seven or eight years in industry moving towards more functional programming. Um, and done well, functional programming really works um, for delivering that value. <clears throat> so when I was trying to figure out how to be a better developer so that I could you know, even begin to learn how to program in a functional programming language, one of the first things I did was, well, I started with John Hughes' paper, Why Functional Programming Matters. Um, I needed the cliff notes to go along with it, so I also read the essay by Ragenwald, um, Reginald Bra Braithwaite, I don't know if anybody knows how to say his name. Um, I don't, um, <laughs> but he wrote an essay called Why, Why Functional Programming Matters Matters, okay? Um, <laughs> so that got me started, and ultimately I realized, hey, I needed to be able to answer that question for myself too. I needed to have my own expression of why, why be functional, you know? So that's when I settled on that coding mantra, simple and correct. For that, I needed to define simplicity. Uh, it's easy to define simplicity if you start with complexity, which is, you know, a very well-known enemy of software engineering. I think complexity is, first and foremost, not being able to reason about our code. Second, not being able to test or prove our code. And finally, not being able to trust our code. Simplicity is just, you know, the direct contrast. Code is simple as if we, code is simple if we can reason about it, if we can demonstrate that it's correct, and we can trust it. Um, so one of the things I really like about functional languages, uh, especially for new developers, is that they tend to constrain us. Um, before that, I had a, a really strong appreciation for languages that were flexible and powerful. You know, uh, C++, Java. I did 10 years as a Perl developer. You know, if you're looking for a language that's flexible, uh, you start with the one that has as its motto, there's more than one way to do it. That mentality um, puts a lot of control in our hands. Um, I actually now lean more towards Python's, there should be one and only one obvious way to do it. But even with Python, you can do it badly. To do it well, to do that one and only one obvious way, you still need training and discipline. I like languages that make it really difficult to do it badly. And we see that a lot more in functional programming languages. I spent like a year trying to figure out how to put that into words. And then uh, at Code Mesh, I saw Phil Wadler's talk, the same one he gave this morning, and he blew my mind. You know, this idea that some languages are discovered and some languages are invented. Some languages feel like a force of nature and others feel like they were bolted together in the garage. Um, and, and that's what I was looking for the whole time. Um, languages that fit together in as few abstractions as possible and abstractions that fit the problem. It's going to be easier to teach to new developers than a language like Scala. Uh, why be functional? We've got state, right? Um, the first thing we usually talk about when we talk about object-oriented versus functional programming languages is mutability and immutability. I narrow that down to predictable. Um, mutable state, especially once we encapsulate it in an object and then put a, an interface on it, it's just not predictable. Um, in fact, it's so unpredictable that when we test it, we often have to mock things up so that we don't inadvertently change our state while we're trying to test things. Uh, often we can't test things without mocking it. In objects, state is also hidden. It's encapsulated, right? Uh, so over time, 
as we're maintaining our code, and we get this richer understanding of the business problem, uh, we get this richer understanding of our objects, and we discover that, hey, our state isn't actually as, as complex as our object is. And we keep building up that state inside of the object where it's hidden, where only we have to see it. And um, it's ugly, but it's hidden, and we leave it that way because it's easier than fixing it. This is you know, how so much technical debt gets into our code often. In functional programming, our state's exposed. If we start to get too much complexity in our state, if we're not modeling our state very well, it's right there as an argument to the function. Every time we interface with that function, we have to deal with the ugliness that's our state. And we don't leave that that way. It's like leaving your dirty socks on the floor. Somebody is going to come along and tell you to clean it up if you don't do it yourself. One of my favorite things about functional programming is, you know, functions. <laughs> um, and functions, I think, are a really strong reason to teach functional programming to new developers. Functional, functions and functional programming are referentially transparent, um, so they're super predictable, right? Easy, easy, easy to test. Simple to reason about. With functional programming, we like to make simple functions and then string them together, function composition. Um, this is still easy to think about. Our state is transformed by the different functions in our pipelines. Easy to think about. Super easy for a developer, a new developer, to understand. Object-oriented programming can't give us this. It just can't. A state is encapsulated and we don't know what might change the state. We can't get referential transparency without programming outside the model. We can't break our methods down easily into, other, into smaller parts and compose them without working outside of the model of the business logic as the methods. And testing methods is tricky because of the way that the state can change on us. Um, locking down reality in object-oriented programming is like our first step in testing. So that's why functional programming languages are best for new developers. Um, it might feel counterintuitive because, well, in industry, we tend to not let a developer start working in a functional programming language in production until they've gone a decade or more with object-oriented programming and didn't kill anyone. But if we start new developers with functional languages, we can get them thinking clearly from the start. I'd, I'd much rather a new developer came along and learned you know, Ruby on Rails after Elixir or Erlang or Haskell so that they can then question why we're doing it that way and look at the ways that experience has helped us do object-oriented programming better. I'm not going to do a lot of, of language advocacy, um, and I don't want to start any flame wars. Um, <laughs> I like Elixir as a language for new developers. New developers. <clears throat> it's mostly functional. Uh, even though it's got agents for state and we've got message passing of, of actors, which feels kind of object-oriented. Um, even new developers can manage complexity pretty well in Elixir, and the testing story is really easy, easy to learn. When I teach a new developer a new language, I feel like I have a responsibility uh, to make it something that they can use. And this was really tricky for me. Where I'm from, we have lots of Scala jobs. Like in functional programming, almost all of the jobs are in Scala. But Scala is, is a hybrid language. And much of the programming that happens in Scala, where I'm from, is still you know, pretty much Java. Um, that's not going to help a new developer. Um, I'm predicting that Elixir is going to end up being pretty big. I think a lot more startups are, gonna, are, are starting to use Elixir. I think in a year, or maybe two years, 
it's going to feel like the new Ruby on Rails, the new Node Express. Um, there are a bunch of reasons for that. I'm going to skip them. Everything that was true about Elixir, I think, is also true about Elm. It's just the front end versus the back end. We're starting to see in Salt Lake City the first companies switching completely to Elm, which maybe is premature at this point, um, but they're excited about it. It seems to be working. So really, that's what it comes down to. We need to teach developers to write simple and correct code. New developers start off writing simple and correct code. All developers, all of my developers, writing simple and correct code. Um, we don't always have that choice. Uh, you know, we have constraints for our jobs. We might need to be working with this language or that language. Um, so I've been working on this concept called functional first development. Basically, it, it's pretty straightforward. You, you code everything you can without side effects. So to start with, you, you only deal with the inputs to functions and the outputs from functions. The only state is in your tests. So that includes you know, reading from standard in, don't do it. No databases, no HTTPS, no standard out, no persisting to disk. Don't mutate any variables. Just write your functions, compose your functions, and then write your tests around that. After you've done everything you can without side effects, then you write your side effects. And this has some, some neat advantages. If we do the first step right, then the second step is only side effects. Our first step makes code that's easy to test. Our second step is code that we don't actually need to unit test because it's all libraries, it's all frameworks. The frameworks come with their own unit tests. This is the stuff that normally we would mock out. So <clears throat> if we do it this way, our core business logic is clean and simple, and it almost never depends on any other libraries. Our side effect code is almost exclusively libraries and frameworks, so we don't have to mock and we don't have to write unit tests around the, the, um, the side effect code. Our side effect code is isolated, it's modular. So if we want to change the database engine we're using, there's nothing to it, because that code is all database. Um, if we want to add a new interface to it, maybe we're doing a web interface now, but we want to connect to a message broker. Um, we're just adding another interface. And this code, whoop, sorry, this code will scale much like it would if we're doing functional programming, even though we're working in a language like Java or JavaScript or Ruby. Um, <clears throat> it is trickier because the languages that we're using aren't supporting the abstractions in the same way. So for instance, Python uh, is going to pass object references by value. If you pass a list into a function in Python and then you do something with that list, Python is mutating that list. So we need to be careful when we're programming this way to make sure that we're only dealing with the outputs from the functions, that we're not relying on the inputs from one function at another point in the code. This is one way that we can help new developers get into functional mindsets without functional languages yet. Um, mob programming. So about a year ago, I, I was talking with Will Bird, and he was telling me about his team at the university in the, C in the computer science lab, and they get together every Friday for coding and pizza for six hours. And they did this because a previous version of the project they were working on was written by one person who only wanted to work heads down, and... Um, and the entire knowledge about that project was locked up in her head and a bunch of lousy code. Nobody else wanted to maintain it, knew how to maintain it. And um, they were writing in Scala, and most of the team didn't know Scala, so they started coding it, the whole project together on Fridays. 
sounded really interesting to me. About the same time, I was starting to plan our women's internship program at OC Tanner, and I had planned on you know, setting it up so that the interns were pairing 100% of the time. And I was talking with Pat Maddox, uh, some people might know Pat from the Ruby community, and he said, hey, have you heard of mob programming? And he explained it to me, and I said, oh yeah, I, Will's doing that at the university, that sounds really cool. So he, he gave me, he connected me with Woody Zool, the guy who kind of started mob programming down in San Diego uh, about five years ago. And, uh, and we did some research and a bunch of talking, a bunch of thinking about it, and ended up deciding to you know, really give it a good go. So this is, this is mob programming, basically. You have like five to 10 people. You have one screen, one computer, one keyboard. Everybody codes, but you have one driver on the keyboard. <clears throat> We've been doing this for a year now, or almost a year. Uh, we do it in three environments. So my team at work mobs. Um, we don't mob full-time, but we mob pretty regularly. Uh, we often attract people from other teams, because you know when we have five or seven people talking out loud, in the middle of our workspace, in front of a big screen TV, it looks like fun. Um, and it, it kind of is. <laughs> so people from other teams come over and join us all the time. Um, on a good day, we might have 13 or 14 or even 15 people come through the mob in one day. Now, that doesn't mean we have 15 people for the entire session, but over the course of the session, we might have 15 different people involved in our mob. Um, other teams started doing it. We have, let me see, three teams right now have mob, mobbing setups in their workspaces, plus we converted two of the conference rooms to mobbing spaces. Uh, we do a weekly testing workshop. If you've got a, a difficult testing problem, you bring it to the workshop, and, and together we figure out how to, how to test it. That's now a mob programming session every week. So we've done a, at least 50 mobbing sessions so far, in, I think, probably seven different languages. I also teach this workshop called An Ounce of Elixir. It's basically functional programming for new developers. We don't deal with any of the theory. We don't deal even with the vocabulary. We just get in and, and do things experientially. Taught these in Salt Lake City and also in London. Um, and the participants for the workshop, the second day is almost all mobbing. Um, during the mob, the problem that they solve is to, is to create a shopping cart. Um, and like I said, we don't, we don't focus at all on the vocabulary, but we do direct them or guide them towards what is an event store, an event-based shopping cart with command query responsibility segregation. So new developers, people who have never worked as a professional developer, Programming in Erlang, functionally, and every single mob has built a CQRS shopping cart on their second day. Uh, the third environment where we've done mob programming is in the women's internship program. Um, so this, this has been just for women, mostly people re-entering the workforce or retraining. So people have taken years off to you know, be with their kids when they were little, or people, like I had one woman in the first one who 15 years as a professional electrician. Um, they, <laughs> they're the only ones who have mobbed every day. Five hours a day, five days a week for three months. Um, the team is actually the four interns and two juniors, and they ran their own mobs. We train our mobs on, on these guidelines. This is a long list. We'll get into individual ones. Um, we started with you know, like recommendations that Woody Zool had promoted, um, and then we changed them, uh, and we added a bunch of our own. So after a year of thinking and doing it, um, this is what we've, we currently have. Uh, start with um, better than having anyone in charge. So that sounds like anarchy, 
<laughs> um, and it is. It's actually based on classical anarchy, mutualism. And I, I was bothered by this at first. You know, like, um, as soon as I started thinking about and talking with people about mob programming, one of the first things I said was, hey, this is just more anarchy. And we've already been, like, introducing more and more anarchy into software engineering teams. And it's true. We have flat, I don't know how it is in Europe. In the States, we are constantly trying to attract new developers in some of the ways we do that. We have flat organizational charts. Everybody reports directly to the CTO or the CEO. We have no rules around engineers, you know? Even if the rest of the company has a dress code, engineers can show up in Birkenstock shorts and a t-shirt. And the t-shirt can have holes in it, it's fine, no problem. Um, your workspace, you know, they'll, they'll buy you the $1,000 um, standing desk or, or even the, the treadmill desk. Um, but we don't care if you go outside and sit in the grass and code, that's fine. If you don't want to code, that's fine too, you know? Take a nap, it's fine. <laughs> we offer flex time, we offer unlimited personal time off, and two weeks ago I learned about this company in Salt Lake City that is now offering unlimited maternity and paternity leave. It's amazing. <laughs> we have very engineering-driven cultures at work. I have worked at a place where they decided to hire me, and then, and then I had to figure out which team I wanted to join, and then I had to figure out what code I wanted to work on. Um, I know of another place in Salt Lake City where they don't give you any instruction on what you're gonna do. What they want is for somebody else on your team, uh, on the development team, to approve your pull requests at least once a month. If you can't get anybody else to approve your pull request, well then maybe we need to talk about your choices. <laughs> <laughs> My team does improv comedy training. Um, that's where the yes and comes from. When you look at an improv comedy team, they never say no. You get up there on a stage in front of a bunch of people and you have to work together, and if somebody says, my name is Delilah. You don't say, no, it's not, you're Rob. You go with it, you know? You build on it. You preserve momentum. We do the same thing in mob programming. When we communicate in a mob, when we talk, we monitor our level of abstraction in our communication. So that means in a mob of juniors, they're gonna talk a lot about what are the correct key combinations in Vim? And how do you do a, the git command that I need to, to type? Seniors, when they're mobbing, they might talk about patterns and architecture and control flow or teach each other monads. But if there are juniors in the mob with seniors, they also talk about key combinations in Vim. The expectation in the mob is that everyone can understand what they feel like they need to understand. Everyone can expect answers to their questions that they can follow. Okay, so we're all functional programmers. We know the difference between an imperative language and a functional language. Uh, I'm sorry, an imperative language and a declarative language. The same thing actually applies to how we communicate with each other. And I learned this because I have an autistic child. As a parent, when we talk to our kids, about 80% of the time, we use imperative language. Pick that up, eat your vegetables, close the door. <clears throat> when we talk to other adults, we tend to be very declarative. You know, like, I feel this, or that thing happened. I I'm willing to bet that you can imagine what work would be like if 80% of our communication with each other at work was imperative. And if you can't imagine it, try doing mob programming without any guidelines. There's this weird thing that happens. As soon as we put someone else between us and the keyboard while we're trying to code, we turn into control freaks. <laughs> type that, no, don't type it that, no, do this. <laughs> 
that doesn't work very well in the mobs. So we, we had to work at staying declarative, saying things like, that function looks funny. I wonder if this test is going to catch all of our edge cases. There's a typo on line 47. I just learned something new. <clears throat> um, thinking out loud becomes really, really important. A quiet mob is just a red flag. That's a mob that's not mobbing. When we're in the mob, we're talking constantly. And, and the talking is like stream of consciousness stuff. You know, we're constantly sharing how we think something might work. And it's entirely reasonable to expect that in the mob. It's hard to learn. Um, we don't actually know how to communicate about our code very well. I mean, even though we're experienced developers, and maybe if we're going to sit down and do a 10-minute code review, we can talk about it, but try to do six hours of coding where you're talking about it constantly, it's really tricky. It's something we, we had to learn to do. Most developers have a hard time thinking and talking at the same time. I don't know if you experience this. I, I know, you know, sometimes I just have to stop the conversation and think it through, and then I can express it. If you add in typing, thinking, talking, and typing, all at the same time, we can't do it. It's really, really hard. As soon as the driver is trying to figure out the code that we're going to write, they get quiet. And now we're not mobbing. We're coding with an audience. One person, solo. It's no good. So nearly every time the driver starts coding, they also stop talking, and that breaks the mob. And we want the driver to be fully engaged with the mob, and we want the mob to be fully engaged with the driver. And the way we do that is we take away the thinking. The driver only types what the, the code that the mob proposes. It's hard to do. Be the driver and know how to do it. And then listen to everybody else tell you a different way. Our egos get in the way. <laughs> hey, anybody here remember their phone numbers by dialing in space? Yeah, I can tell you my grandparents' number when I was five years old. It's 609-662-8236. Uh, or if I was at my grandparents' house, my home phone number, you know, it was six, six. <laughs> <clears throat> we learn differently when we code. We learn kinetically. We learn with our muscle memory. When we're typing, we're learning kinetically. It's a really valuable way of learning. It's a different way of learning when we're typing than when we're coding in the mob when we're navigating, when we're not the driver. Um, there was a study done that says, if you learn to do something, and in the middle of learning it, you switch how you're learning it, you change the situation, we actually can increase the speed with which we learn a new skill twofold. I think we're seeing that in our mob programming. Okay, so the last and most important guideline we give is that learning is contributing. Almost every mob we've done has had at least one person who didn't know what was going on and didn't want to disrupt the flow of the mob because, well, everybody else knew what was going on, or so they thought. It's, not, it's almost never true. Um, we, we really needed to find ways to make sure that everybody knew it was okay to stop the mob and learn about what was happening. Um, I'll tell you one benefit of that. As soon as you explain your code, you see the problems with it. I mean, like when you're in a flow and you're just coding along, you know, it, it's nice. You know, our tests are going to catch it later. Probably beta tests in the field, but their tests are going to catch the problems later. But if you stop and explain what you're doing to someone else who isn't keeping up, and let me tell you that someone else who's not keeping up is very often me, the most senior member on the team. Um, as soon as you explain your code, 
you, you start to see it differently. You start to see it from somebody else's perspective. You, you kind of have to defend it. And you find problems a lot more quickly. And usually, if there's one person who will stop the mob and say, I don't get it, we find that there are at least two or three other people who are in the same boat, and we're just hoping that maybe they'd catch on. Um, and we, we have juniors who need to learn how to code, need to learn how to deliver the value, right? So we have a responsibility to them to make sure that they understand. And we have seniors who, like me, often aren't, aren't comfortable admitting how much they don't understand. Um, so it's a great time for a junior to come along and say, hey, I don't get it, and then I can just sit back and you know, learn. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is our last guideline. I love this. This is straight from Woody Zool. Turn up the good. If it works, do it more. This is like, you know, it should be a life motto. If it works, do more of it. <laughs> um, I translate this directly into do good re retrospectives, which, you know, sounds not as fun as turn it up. Um, but we do. We actually did retrospectives after virtually every mobs programming session we did last year. Um, standard questions for my team uh, with seniors is uh, what went well, what went poorly, what do you want to try differently, and what has you baffled? Um, the interns, like I said, the interns, they, they ran their own mobs. So they came up with their own questions. And they went through oh, like three or four iterations of different questions. But what they settled on was, what should we keep doing? What should we stop doing? What should we start doing? And what surprised you? For the workshops, I get kind of touchy-feely. And so we go with, how do you feel about your code? How do you feel about your team? How do you feel about yourself? It's really good. The retrospectives are great. We're not going to get into them, I can tell. Um, but I have a bunch of them, and when I finally get these slides online, you should totally read them. <laughs> okay, so this gets us into the retrospectives. I think there is, what, like three minutes left? Anybody know? When are we supposed to be done? Somebody stop me when I have to stop. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got a bunch of slides on what we did wrong, which is basically how we learned the guidelines that we learned. Um, I'm going to go to... Um, bu -bu -bu -bum. Where is it? Okay. So I've mobbed probably 100 times with probably 100 different people in the last year, and there was always this one guy who caused problems. That guy was me. Um, <laughs> more often than not, I was the problem. The teams that I mob with, I'm the boss, right? So I'm in a position of authority. And then we come along and we make this happy little hippie um, egalitarian mob where everybody is supposed to have you know, the same weight in determining how we do things. And I say, oh, but I don't want to use Java. And they say, in the retrospective, I was unhappy we didn't use Java 8, and I got a preemptive shutdown before I even brought it up. <laughs> I think it's different for you because you are in a position of authority. It's taken a lot of trust to get to the point where people would disagree with me, um, and a lot of that trust comes from me not expressing any opinions anymore, I'm just trying to listen and, and watch what the mob comes up with. I don't say I don't want to use Java anymore. I trust that they remember that comment from before. <laughs> In the workshops, um, people have said really positive things about the declarative versus imperative, that it's really worked for them, that it's something that they had to learn how to do that they kept finding themselves in situations where they wanted to say, don't do that, but they needed to say it declaratively. So they say, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> in every mob we've done, there have been a few people who said, you know, this doesn't work for me. Mob feels too big. I'm happier working by myself. I want a beer. 
Okay, so the interns did their own retrospectives. I didn't even read their, re don't tell them, I didn't even read their retrospectives until after their internship was over. Um, and it, it was really cute, it was great, I loved it. This was their first day. Their first day, you know, I had trained them and said, hey, you're gonna share a keyboard and you're gonna pass it around and it's gonna be fun. And they're like, I don't wanna touch your keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> what if we just learn Git? You know, and then we can just like each use our own computer. Every time we change drivers, let's change computers. And they did, and they loved it. It worked really well for them after they figured things out. They, um, they had to figure out how often to change drivers. They had to get good at Git. They, um, they had concerns about how long it took to push and pull. They'd forget to push their code. You know, oh, I just pulled and I thought that, didn't, didn't we, where's? Yeah, <laughs> doesn't just happen to interns. Okay, um, so we, we did a lot of things really right with our mobbing. Um, for our team mobbing, we, we really built the team up. We communicate really well with each other. We care about our work. We care about the work that each other is doing. We know what everybody else is working on. I mean, even now, we're not even mobbing that often, and my team, which is really quite small right now, um, we're on three different projects, but we mob on each of those projects at least one day a week. I put stuff in bold. I don't know if that sticks out for you, but as I, as I slam through these, just read the bold parts and come back for the rest later. Um, oh, okay. So one of the... Um, <laughs> it really helps in a lot of areas there. Everyone on the team feels like they own the code. Right, just like you said, it helps with ownership of the code. Everyone on the team knows what's going on in the code. They don't have to sit down and you know, spend half their time trying to figure it out. Everyone on the team is starting to converge on the same basic skill level. Like, our team has more uniform skills than any other team in the company. Um, inside the mob, outside the mob, we don't have people questioning value. Inside the mob, we did it every day. We were constantly saying, you know, I... I'm afraid of slowing down the team. I don't know how to do this. I feel guilty for stopping us, and I feel guilty for not being a better developer. I'm gonna finish up here. Uh, my slides will be online soon. Um, the one thing that I, I wanna point out is that um, we did qualitative analysis on this, not quantitative. Um, we needed to learn how to mob, and I did not want to go into it saying, and I'm going to prove that the value is there. So we haven't done that yet. Based on our experience, I, want, I think we can start making these claims as hypotheses and start testing them, and that most of them are going to be true. Thank you. <laughs>